afternoon, everybody. My name is Bob McGoy. I'll be your host this afternoon for simulation results and conversion method, methods inside of SOLIDWORKS. With that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Matt Fetke, um, one of our members of our simulation team, and he's going to walk you through um, convergence methods inside of SOLIDWORKS. Thank you. Hello, everybody. So this is going to be a short meeting here, about 30 minutes, and um, I've prepared a, a small slide deck here just to kind of guide us through this. Um, we're going to be looking at just what is simulation in general, just a very short introduction, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page there. And then we're going to look at results convergence and uh, how adaptive meshing can help us in that regard, and then we'll look at certain hotspots, and we'll explain those terms as we, as we get there. So the first thing here is, what exactly is simulation? Well, it's a way to figure out if your parts are going to break under a certain load, basically, is, is the reason why we use it, at least. So we start with some CAD geometry here. We typically simplify it a little bit to, to make the problem a little smaller. And then we look at some mathematical things here, like what kind of material, how big is the load, and then we want to discretize the load, uh, the model, excuse me, so that we can solve equations. And we need to be able to break it up into pieces. So a number line is, is basically infinite, but we can't handle that in a mathematical model. So that's why we're breaking it up into pieces here. And then we can solve it on the corners of these elements here and at the midpoints of the elements as well. Obviously, a lot of the elements will share nodes, so the, the number of nodes might be less than what you might expect just because of the node sharing going on here. But this is what we're going to be looking at uh, in this webcast. Is my mesh good enough? Is it going to give me the, the correct results? Uh, the, the, the math will give you the correct results, but if you haven't put in the right parameters, you're not going to get the answer to the question you want to get the answer to. So that's what we're going to look at here. Um, the first, uh, so what we're going to look at here is results convergence. Uh, we're going to compare the solution to the mesh uh, and see basically a graphical representation of if we just kind of get an idea if we think the mesh is dense enough or maybe if it's too dense, it's too thick. So this is just getting some sort of idea of where we're at. Then we're going to look at the convergence based on as we increase the mesh density, or in some cases we could even decrease it. But uh, the, talking about density here, just talking about how many elements there are across the faces here. So as we increase that, they should all start to converge at a single value. That would give us the real stresses in the part. Now we're going to talk about when we have stresses that aren't real later on. And the aspect ratio we're looking at for the, our elements, basically uh, this is comparing the three sides of a triangle, if it's equilateral, the aspect ratio would be one, right? If, uh, if, we, have a, uh, if we have a triangle that is, has legs of three, four, and then maybe one as, as another leg, then the aspect ratio there would be a maximum of four because you have a ratio of one to four there. So this is what we're talking about here, is just keeping this under three as much as possible. And then we can look at the mesh details here. Um, I'll show you what that is. It gives us all this information about how many elements um, and how many are under this three ratio here. And then we'll look at mesh quality plot. And finally, uh, we want to make sure that we have at least two elements in the thickness. Like you can see here uh, where my cursor is, there's at least two elements in the thickness there. So let's get into SOLIDWORKS here. And uh, I have a few parts prepared here. So first of all, I want to look at uh, the mesh quality here. We're just looking at some examples of what might give us a bad mesh. And uh, so the first one here is going to show you uh, what a poor mesh would look like. Uh, we can see here some elements here are highly distorted. Uh, let's say that's one. What would this be? That would be more like 10 or, or, or somewhere along that lines. So this is a bad element there. Uh, and how do we know how many elements are bad? How do we know how many are under three? Well, there's a few ways that we can do that. Uh, one way, we could just right-click on this mesh here and go to Details. And let me put 
this in the center here. So what you're going to see here, I'll just make it big here to filter out some noise here. And uh, what we're going to see here is that the mesh quality, well, is set to high, but that's just a setting and when we mesh it. So looking at it here, we see the maximum aspect ratio is 43. That's an element that's pretty highly stretched. And we see that only 39% of them are less than a, an aspect ratio of 3. So this is really a key number here. I'd like this number to be about 95%, but it's it's really bad. And then we have 10% of them, 10% of the elements have an aspect ratio greater than 10. So that's uh, a highly distorted element. Most of the time, you're going to have some elements that are greater than 10, like 0.5%, and that would be acceptable, but certainly not 10%. That's not acceptable. We can also visualize this here. Once we have the mesh created on our part, we can right-click here and go to Mesh Quality Plots and uh, just create one here based on aspect ratio. This is what we were talking about. Uh, we weren't talking about this, so aspect ratio is what we're looking at. And we can see here that uh, the aspect ratio, the greatest one is 43. Uh, I'm just going to modify my plot here and change it to 3. So 3, we want things to be less than 3, but we see that everything that is red or higher has an aspect ratio greater than 3. I'm just going to show you a little technique here called mesh sectioning. Just right-click on the plot and go to mesh sectioning. And we look at internally and see what it looks like internally. Maybe, maybe I should turn these flags off. But, um, so internally, we've seen a lot of red elements also. And the, one of the greatest stretch is not visible on this particular cut plot, but I can maybe show it right there. It's one of these ones on the on the fillets here. Okay, so this is this is really bad. Um, so let's show another mesh here that's a little bit better here. I'm going to go ahead and show the mesh here for you guys. Um, shouldn't be taking this long, but any second now. There we go. So we still we see that we still have these fillets here. Uh, if you're familiar with FEA or if you've taken one of our classes, then you'll know that these fillets on the outside don't really contribute to the strength of the part. And so all it's doing is, is making us have to add more elements to account for the curvature of this little fillet here. More elements because of the curvature means more equations to solve. So let's go to mesh details here real quick, and we'll take a look at this real quick here. And it says, uh, 98.9. So this is what I, I would consider to be a good mesh. Now, talking about number of equations, we're looking at basically um, 400,000 equations that's solving, which is not too bad. Uh, so this is a pretty good mesh here, but I might actually want to get rid of these fillets here. So if I was to show that to you here real quick, I just have to activate the configuration here. Uh, I did try to delete this appearance, but... Um, every time I go into the study, it recreates the appearance. <laughs> so we have to live with it. But here we go. I just deleted it again. And you can see that the fields here are gone, and it's just a sharp corner there. Uh, so this is going to have a, a great effect because our number of elements, our number of nodes have decreased by about a third. Now we only have 100,000 instead of 145,000. Really not a big deal for a, a part of a problem of this size. But when we're talking about 2 million nodes, reducing the number of nodes by 30% is going to make a, a big difference on the, the time it takes to solve this. And so I can just show you what the stress plot looks like here real quick. And we're seeing 58.159 as the maximum stress. I'm going to go into details here. I want to show you one more thing. Time to complete the mesh was about 3 seconds. So it also gives us that information here. Um, and we'll, so you can see the value before you even run it, uh, how much time you're saving just to mesh it, not to run it. I want to go ahead and compare these results here real quickly. I can just compare them across to all configurations here because I have a configuration where I actually modified the geometry to remove the fillets. So I'm going to show them across all here, and I'll just show you what it looks like. So this is what I'm talking about, the, the answer you're getting here. This is the answer that I was getting with this really poor mesh here, 45 um, megapascals. And then when I increased the mesh quality, I got an answer of about 58 megapascals. 
So that's a pretty big difference in value. Did Solaris give me the wrong pro answer here? No. It, this is the right answer based on how I've set up the problem. I have set up the problem very, very poorly, so I got a poor solution. Uh, here, the problem is much more uh, well-defined because of that, uh, the mesh quality is much better. Now, you see removing those fillets really didn't change the value at all. You've seen a minimal effect here. All right, so you can definitely see the difference here in the value and making sure that your mesh is converged. Now, the convergence value is probably going to be about 58 there. I haven't actually converged this one. Uh, I've, I've done this on another problem here, so I'm going to go ahead and make this one active. And I'm keeping tabs on the questions here. I'm not currently seeing any questions at all, but if you do, please feel free to type them in the chat there. So I have another part here that I've done a, a little study on, just put a load on it and fixed one end of it. And I've added in the trend tracker here. Um, to do that, I'll have to create a new study here, actually. But to do that, you just right-click here and you turn on the trend tracker. Just right-click on the study there. And, and then what, uh, what happens is that when you do your first run, your first run of the study, it actually creates a baseline and then it adds more iterations as you solve the problem again. And of course, we're not going to solve the problem with the exact same input. We're going to change the input. And here I have done that. I have changed the input by changing um, the mesh. So I've made a denser and denser mesh as I've, as I've uh, gone through these iterations here. And you're going to see here that I had a pretty coarse mesh, not a very high quality mesh here. And then I increased density, did some stuff here, added a uh, mesh control, uh, local mesh control here, and then basically I got up here to a value of about uh, almost 59, uh, and we're in KSI here, so 59 KSI. And then I did one more enhancement, and I see that it didn't really have any effect on the model. So the, the change between consecutive iterations was really small, and this is what I consider to be converged. So coming back over here, uh, talking about results convergence, this would be converged. And so now I know that my solution is the real solution for the part. Of course, you're still going to want to, you know, simulation doesn't replace real life testing. Basically, what happens with this is that we can reduce the iterations of real life testing. We can get the solution converged like this. And assuming that our setup was correct, which there, there is some assumptions made in our setup which we have to account for. Then let's go ahead and make the part. Let's test it and see how it compares. And then hopefully we only have to real life test it once. And so now I think we're ready for real life testing because I've converged my solution here. Uh, obviously a big difference here from my first iteration. Once again, it's not the software that's unreliable. It's the, it's the user. It was me that was unreliable. I gave it some bad information and it gave me a bad answer as a consequence. So it's important to, to do this here, and this is something we talk about in our classes as well. Make sure that you run it a few times, and uh, what we do is we just come over here to the mesh, we go to create mesh, and we just put increasingly smaller values in here and run it and compare it to our previous run and see how much the, the solution is changing from one iteration to the next. <clears throat> All right, so looking at details here real quick, we see that um, we have about a million equations here. So it comes at a cost. It took 11 seconds to run this, which isn't bad at all. This is still a pretty fast run. But it does come at a cost, so it's important to be aware of that. And this is a highly dense mesh. Uh, you probably don't you have to, you don't have to go nearly as far as uh, what I went. Probably going here and then going there, you'll probably get a, a solution that's converged enough because that's a very minimal change, about a, about a 10% change, which, well, it might be minimal depending on the factor of safety, right? If your factor of safety is 1.2, then this is not good enough. You need to make sure that we, we converge it even, even further. If your factor of safety is 2, then this is fine. So it, it depends on the application as well. Um, 
So that's what we mean when we're talking about results convergence here. Um, we talked about the SS aspect ratio here. Oh, excuse me, uh, the first one here, I want to show that to you. So if I come over here and I show you one of these stress results plots, I'll just take a few seconds to load it here. Uh, I see a pretty smooth mesh here. This is a nice indication that we have a good enough um, density of elements because it's nice and smooth, it's not like all spotty and stuff. Uh, but if I go to settings here, I can overlay the mesh on top. And this is one of my favorite uh, ways to view mesh plots because I can see if the stress concentrations, that's the values in the yellow and the red, if they're following some sort of weird element, you know, here, like maybe there's a spike in element, I get a spike in stress value uh, or not. And here it's just pretty consistent throughout. So that is a nice mesh there. I think I can show you an example here, I'll only take a second, of maybe a, 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 what wouldn't look good. Um, so I have my poor mesh here on this part. just have to activate the configuration here, and then I have some results. So this is kind of spotty here. See how that's kind of spiky and, and just doesn't look very smooth. But you're not going to see that in the real part. In the, in the real solution, you're not going to see that. You're going to see something that's more consistent. So that's your first indication. If I come over here to settings, and I was to show you the mesh for this model here, you can see how the red kind of follows the lines of the elements here. Basically, it's doing an averaging across these elements here, and the averaging is not very good because we don't have enough elements. It's kind of like the the slugger that starts off the, the MLB season hitting five home runs in the first five games. You're like, whoa, he's going to hit 160 home runs. No, you have a small sample. <laughs> he's probably going to hit more like 40 home runs. So this is what's going on here, just a small sample size, and we're not getting a good average. Um, so you do want to increase that mesh size here. Okay, so we looked at mesh convergence here. What do we mean by adaptive mesh? So there's two different types of adaptive mesh. We have the H adaptive and the P adaptive. And these are available in uh, SOLIDWORKS Simulation Professional. So if you have SOLIDWORKS Premium or if you have SOLIDWORKS Simulation Standard, you, you won't have access to these, unfortunately. And they are only available for static studies. So you won't be able to see them in a thermal study or a nonlinear study. But what we're talking about here with H adaptive is that we're taking a model and we're running it and we're allowing the software to adapt the mesh. Not us, but the software to do it. And so you can see that this is what happened internally. It densi densified the mesh in areas that needed it. This is high stress areas and areas of high curvature where the mesh is, where the stress value is changing a lot from one node to the next. It's actually more uh, related to strain. As the strain changes a lot, it has to make those elements smaller and more denser. Areas where there's basically no stress, it can, there's an option to tell it to allow the element size to become bigger. And so that's what's happened here. It was smaller to begin with, and they've uh, just the, the, the solver just increased the element size here because the stress value was so small that it wasn't important. Oops, wrong button there. Uh, the P adaptive actually allows you to change the order of the elements. So we're talking about uh, the curvature ability of the elements. So here on the left, you see an example of a first order mesh. This is what we would call draft quality. And it's just straight lines. Before the the black is before deformation, the red is after deformation, so straight lines. Very few parts are just straight, and very few parts are just like cubes, right? And most of them have at least holes or some sort of curvature on them. So this isn't going to model the curvature very well. We like draft quality because it's a nice way just to run and make sure things are going to run before we commit to the, the higher quality mesh. So we like it, but it's not what we're using for our final solution. And then here's a high quality mesh here. Uh, it's straight lines before deformation, but uh, they can 
uh, shape, they can get the cur both of these mesh types can get the curvature because they can increase in the density of the elements so that they can model the, the curvature. So both of them can model the curvature before deformation. But after deformation, they, this draft quality doesn't do a very good job uh, at, at modeling the deformation of the part because it can only deform in straight lines where the high quality element, which is the default type that you use. Um, and I'll show you where the options are for those, by the way, when we get there, but um, you see how there's like an extra node. It does mean that solving more equations, four equations versus 10 equations, but this is going to give you um, the solution that you need. And this is the maximum quality, uh, order of elements that you can define. First order and second order is the maximum order. But if you turn on the P adaptive function, the software can increase that in order, or they're up to fifth order. So if you remember from uh, your geometry class, um, or maybe it's pre-calc, but a straight line is a first order. A, uh, you know, not an ellipse, um, lost the term here, but, uh, an arc is basically a second order. It's not the term I'm looking for. And then when you want to do like an S-shaped S curve, that would be a third order. So for every hump in your curve, you add an additional order. So basically what's, what's happening is that as we add more orders, we can, do, we, can, we can deform these lines in more flexible ways so that they can match up to the curvature and the, and the deformation more closely. Typically, if I was going to do both, I would do H adaptive first, and then I would do a P adaptive second after. And they can't stack like that. That's fine. So coming down here to H adaptive, here's an example that we might work on here. Um, and then we start with, a, this is what we started with. And then the software changed the mesh, compared the two values, knows that there was a pretty significant change. So it went to another iteration. And I went through another iteration and then another, and this, the strain quite, uh, so basically the, what we're looking, we can define this number here for what's the maximum um, value to, to define convergence. Basically, we compare this value, well, in here, in this case, we're, we're comparing a strain, like I said before, but essentially what we're doing is we're comparing one value to the next and saying how much was the change between consecutive values. And then we can tell it, well, if it's less than 3%, we're good. If it's more, okay, probably not good. And, and we, or 5% or, or whatever it is you want it to be. And then an example of P adaptive here. The geometry won't, I mean, the, the mesh won't change in the appearance, the topology of it. It's the exact same that we saw in the first iteration, but the results do start to converge because those are becoming higher and higher order elements. Okay, so what would this look like in practice and how would we do that? Um, I have an example of that here using this one right here. It's still loading. Just one moment, please. Actually, I opened up the wrong one here. It's the blade. So we have the H adaptive study here. Um, I just called it that, right? You can right click and call these things whatever you want to call them. So here's the H adaptive here, and I have used the, um, just a second here. I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of the appearance here so you can see it better. Okay, so I have used the one without the fillets on it. I'll simplify geometry here. So I did allow these fillets to stay. <clears throat> so, you come over here and you select a mesh. Oops, that's the wrong button. Um, just create mesh. Um, I'll show you where we talk about draft quality. It's under advanced here, draft quality. So this is off by default. Uh, five and one, that, that should be pretty good. See how fast the mesh is here. All right, that's, that's good. So. It's high quality by default. We see two elements in the thickness, which is good. One element in the thickness is not good. Remember, we mentioned that before. That's not what we want, but at least two. Uh, more than two is even better, obviously. Three would be great. 
Um, but this is what we're going to work with here. So if I go to the study here and I go to, into the properties of the study, you'll see that there's this adaptive tab here. Yeah, once again, you do have to have a simulation professional or higher, and you will, um, you will need to be in a static study. So if I go to adaptive here, I can choose if I want to use an adaptive method or not. Um, obviously, it's off by default. So if I choose H adaptive, I can tell the target accuracy here. Um, and then the number, maximum number of loops, well, maybe I want to increase that. It goes to five as a max. That's the default. However, I can run it. If it goes through five loops and it doesn't meet this accuracy that I'm looking for here, I can rerun it and it will go through five more loops or until it meets the accuracy. Um, we can talk about the, the accuracy really shortly here. It's not something I want to go too in depth then, but I, I can show you the criteria for that at least. Um, and then if we turn this button on, it allows the mesh to get less dense, to get more coarse. In other words, as um, there's areas of low stress. All right, so we hit OK. And it does its thing, and then we can run this here. And it will go through some loops, as I said. All right. Shouldn't take too long. See, one loop went pretty fast. Uh, so I try to, I try to run some things when I can, um, so you guys can see what's happening. Um, this convergence here is completely different. The convergence that you saw there very briefly has to do with the solver method, We're doing an iterative method, um, not an uh, um, direct sparse. So iterative has loops and I'm not talking about that, but I just want, I want to emphasize that the iteration, you, the, the convergence you saw there was nothing to do with the mesh. And then, as we see here, on a, um, at a diff well, we go to settings here, and we can show the mesh here. I, I am aware of the mesh that popped up there, but, um, and so here's our mesh here, 58.159. So that's, that's one way of doing it. I want to show you, like I said, briefly the definition, because I do get that question, what does it mean by uh, accuracy? Well, I'll show you a strain plot here. Now, there's two types of the two ways of looking at this. We can look at it as a nodal or an elemental. And nodal basically is let me show the mesh here. It basically averages the values across the elements. So you see how each element is kind of a shade of different colors here. Um, that'll make more sense in a second here when I change this to ele elemental. So you see elemental there is uh, the whole the whole element is just a single value, and it's averaged internally. So elemental is kind of averaged within the element, and then a single value is reported for that element. Nodal is it averages across the nodes of the elements, and then it shades it appropriately. So I think you're catching on. The idea is that if our elements were infinite, basically zero, that's a hard word for me to say, basically zero, there would be no difference between what we're seeing in elemental and what we're seeing in nodal. They would be identical. And that would be the ideal situation. Unfortunately, we do have to, to make elements in order to break our parts up into pieces in order to solve. So we can't have zero length nodes here. That, that would be ideal, but not possible. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna see the difference between these two values. And that is underneath um, that is underneath uh, what we call the total strain energy error. Uh, I'm looking in the wrong area here. Sorry, I need to do a stress plot. All right, so uh, talking about energy norm error here, and this is basically the difference. If you were to take these two different types the nodal and the elemental and stack them on top of each other and then compare them. This is basically the difference between them. So this is showing you where the elements are not, are, are too big, essentially. 
the element is too big here and needs to be smaller. Um, this is quite a bit of an error here, actually. It's not um, not, a, not very good. So, so that's what I was talking about when, when we're talking about accuracy. Okay, and then the, I can show you P adaptive here. I'm actually showing it to you on the crank arm. This one's a little more simple model. Not that the other one took a long time to run, but this one will be even faster. And I'll just show it to you real quickly here. Um, going to static here and just right clicking and and in the properties here we can choose a P adaptive method here and then we're looking at the change in the screen energy is uh one percent is the default here, I think. I'm just gonna put in three. And then we can up update elements with relative strain energy error of 2% or more. So um, this number should probably be bigger than this number. I'm going to put in 4 because this is where it stops. Okay, so once it sees a change of 3 or less, it's going to stop. Um, so we're almost done here. Um, the, the starting order is 2, the maximum order is 5, and the number of loops is 4. So while it's running real quick, I'm going to show you, uh, introduce the, the next topic here, which is hotspot. Sometimes we have stresses that do not converge. Remember, the ones that converge are real. The ones that do not are not real. So stress is basically uh, force divided by area. Now, when the area, you're talking about an edge here, is the area on this edge is zero, right? Um, so what's anything divided by zero? It's infinity. infinity. Uh, that's kind of a problem. It's not so much a problem if you're aware of it here. So in this case, uh, we have the sharp corner here, and we're fixing it up here. We're fixing on the edges up here, and then we're putting a load here, and we're seeing this high stress here. Uh, so we have a way to check for that. I'm going to show you the P adaptive mesh here real quick. Um, hmm, sounds like a ram. But anyways, uh, I show that to you. So let's go ahead and um, let's go into the diverge one right here. I just want to I just want to show you the options for the P adaptive. Here's our converge plot right here. Uh, we don't have a static study here, and uh, there's a trend tracker information here. I'm going to show that in a second. But you see how everything's kind of dense here. Uh, I mean, kind of red here. It's really thick. I'm going to show you what the mesh looks like. It's probably going to look pretty black along that edge because the mesh is super dense. See, really tiny elements here. So as we look at the trend tracker data here, we'll see that the stresses do not converge. They actually diverge. Uh, here it goes from about 15 to about 32, about a change of 100%. So it's not converging. Uh, what do we do? Um, let me show you another one that's just really simple here, uh, really simple mesh. Not too dense. Yeah, that's fine. So you might not see it at first. It's kind of what I want to show you here because um, it's not going to look as dramatic. Oh, uh, constraints are important. Yes. I'm just going to copy them over from static one here. So I've got the fixture here and then the load here. Uh, okay. We'll just rerun it. So it'll take a second. And you'll see the stress will be higher on that edge, but not like extremely high. So how do you know if it's real or not? See, it's just a three. <laughs> Doesn't look too bad. Uh, if I showed you the the mesh here, you um, see that, well, that's why it looks that way. You know, the, the mesh element is so big here, it's actually averaging across the, the meshes, the, the elements here. And it, it can't really do a better job at averaging because the element is so big. It's um, if I was to compare the two, though, no, no, this configuration, there we go, <laughs> and uh, let's compare the three, you would see 32 and 3. So this is, how would you know that this is not real? Well, part of it comes with experiencing, understanding that that's a sharp edge there. Part of it comes with just... Uh, understanding that you need to increase the size of the mesh and then run it again to make sure that the values converge. This is not a problem here. 
we basically all we have to do is ignore the stresses around that edge and understand that the highest stress isn't going to be 32. Um, but there is a way of finding out here. Um, let me exit the compare there. And this is a, here's basically the same study here. If you right click and you go to um, hotspot diagnostic, that came out in uh, 2017, and it's been enhanced since then. So sensitivity factor here, um, you, you might have stress concentrations that are perfectly natural, and you might have some that aren't natural. This one is not natural um, because of that sharp corner there. So the sensitivity, if it's too uh, low, you might be getting stuff. You might be getting stuff that you really don't want to get. So I don't know. I just put it basically middle is where I like to put it for the most part. Um, and it says there's a hotspot detected. Okay, great. And um, you can kind of see it there. It's hard to see, so I want to come over here and isolate it. And you see it's on these edges here. It says hotspot diagnostic um, has identify these. This just means that there's a concentration of stress here. Like I said, this is perfectly normal for most parts to have stress concentrations. But then the question is, are they real stresses or not real? We call them singularities, right, because they're divided by zero. So the answer is become singular from a mathematical definition. So we can come, can we come over here and run it for singularity diagnostic. And this will take a few seconds here, um, longer, depending on the size of your model. But um, it's wrapping up here. So you might be, want to be careful about using this. If you have two million equations, um, this will take a little while. Uh, so just be, be mindful of that. But um, in a second here, okay. Stress singularities detected and explains what that is here. Basically, successive mesh refinements just increase the mesh, not not converge the mesh. And then you can um, isolate it here. And you actually have a convergence graph here because the software itself did some iterations. It did, you know, internally, and it just said, okay, it's increasing exponentially. There's a there's a singularity there. All right, so. What we looked at here was the simulation, just in general, what is the simulation? Then we looked at, uh, you know, you need to fix your load and you need to use the mesh to, and then solve it. So we compared solutions to the mesh using, showing the mesh on top of the stress and just seeing if the, uh, if it's averaging the values in a neat sort of way, like a, a smooth sort of way, or is it kind of spotty, like you saw. Uh, does the solution converge to a value and shows the mesh quality plots? Compared to H versus P adaptive, uh, changing the sizes versus changing the order. And then we looked into hotspot diagnostic. Um, I was saying that when they diverge, they're not real solutions. And we just need to be mindful of that. All right, do we have any questions? Let's see, there was a question on one of your first slides you had where you were showing your convergence between iteration and iteration th two and three. They wanted to know how you knew it did not converge. This one we were talking about? Yeah, yeah. See, between two to three, it's actually just as flat as it was at six to seven. Oh, yes, good question. Okay, so what happened here was I actually um, didn't really change the mesh a whole lot. And so that's the problem I had here. I made a very small adjustment to the mesh. In fact, what I did here was I just added a mesh control to some some faces, to some curved spaces, and the mesh control was not very big. So you saw a very small difference between the number of elements here and the number of elements here, and a very small change in the topography of that mesh. So that, that's a good question, but yeah, I I messed up here by not providing a big enough change in the mesh. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. You're welcome. Uh, I think what I was doing here for the mesh um, was basically cutting it in half. I and mean, you got to be really careful doing that if you have a big model. But um, it, the previous iteration I think was 0.1, and I cut it down to 0.05 um, for the maximum size. You might not want to do such a big step depending on what you're working with. Alrighty, great question.